So my name is uh, Pastor Vaughn, and I'm actually, uh, I'm on staff over at the Nampa campus. I'm in the Next Gen department, and uh, I get the opportunity to fill in for Pastor Jason. He wanted me to tell you that he misses you greatly as he's finishing up his, uh, his battle with COVID. He's doing very well, so that's a huge answer to prayer. Thank you. He wanted to make sure and let you know, thank you for praying for him. Um, uh, and he'll be back with you quickly and shortly. So anyways, with that, I would ask, if you have your Bibles with you, go ahead and open to Psalms chapter 139. Psalms 139. And what we're doing is we're continuing on the sermon series of the playlist, and I get chapter 139. And it's no accident that Lester actually opened with the scripture that he did. I, I found it absolutely awesome, so I'm glad that he did that. But what we're going to do is we're going to focus in on chapter 139. But before I start that, I'm going to date myself. It just got blue up here. All right, there we go. Um, I'm going to date myself a little bit and somebody else in the crowd. How many of you have been in Idaho a really long time? All right, good. There's a few of us out there. That's good. Nothing against those that are new to Idaho. Welcome. But back in the day, and I'm going to use back in the day because I don't really want to tell you how old I am. I'm 45. Back in the day, we had the I, our IDs looked way different than they did now. Back, and I'm not going to tell you how I know this, but back then, what you it was just a card stock of paper, and you could put all of the sensitive, truthful data on that cardstock, and then it was laminate. It was laminated together. And my mom is in here, so please forgive me, mom. So as teenagers, what you could do is peel it apart and then alter some of the information. Now, I'm not going to tell you why a teenager would want to change their birth date, but you could do that. And then what you do is you take a T-shirt, two T-shirts, put it together, and then you gently iron it, and then it would seal back together. Now, I'm not saying that I did that. I didn't, I swear, I didn't do that. But I had lots of friends that would do that. The problem that I have, and, and, and the thing about it is, when I'm reading Psalms 139, it's an identity chapter. And I bet after today, you won't look at it the same way. But it truly is an identity chapter. We're setting the tone for truth. And we're setting the tone for two people's identity. God's and mine. But the problem with today is we like to get in there and peel the, the uh, protective layer off and change things. I'm, I'm a big into lightning rod issues, all right? So here you go. I figured I'd use this as an analogy. How many genders are, are we talking about now? So I'm old school. I go by the Bible. I, I think there's two genders, right? And so I'm Googling. I figured I'd use this for effect. I'd, I'd, maybe somebody could come up with four. I'll give you four, maybe. And so I'm Googling, and it went from four to 15, then it went to 52, and I stopped scrolling at 64. And I'm, I'm, I'm looking at it, and I'm like, what is going on? We are peeling that apart, and we're changing whatever we want to change now. And, and thank God for His Word, because how do we stop this runaway freight train? The runaway freight train is stopped by getting back to identity. And that sets a tone for Psalms 139. So if you have your Bibles, hopefully you're there. And I'm, this is highly participative in nature. So if you have a King James Version or NIV Version or a New King James Version, get ready. I'm going to pick on you. Okay, so Psalms 139, verse number one, it starts, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know where I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. Verse number three, this is big. Check this out. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Okay, so I am reading the ESV version, English Standard Version. Anybody out there have a KJV? King James? Nobody? Oh, good. Awesome. I'm glad you're here, brother. The second word in, in verse number three says what? Yell it. Right. Compass set. Right. I say compass set because back in the day I used to think it was a compass. Okay. We're going to get to that. Anybody have a new King James? Yes. Vinny. Comprehend. Does anybody have a uh, NIV? NIV. Go for it. Discern. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So ESV says search. KGV says compass set. 
And, and originally, I used to think it was like a compass. It makes sense in the context of the scripture. Actually, okay, so I'm nerding out here. Actually, that's not at all what, what the intent was. Compass set actually means to scatter, toss, diffuse, cast away, disperse, fan, or even, get this, spread. Why is that used here? Well, I'm glad you asked. So they're the, one of the smartest dudes I know actually goes to Dallas Theological Seminary. And I called him up, and his name is Jack Renneker. His dad's here, in the, and family's here. I said, Jack, you've got to do a word search on this word for me because it's blowing my mind. Why would God scatter my path? Why, that doesn't make sense to me. So he, he got back to me. He said, the verb is interesting in that it is the only case I could find it um, find of this verb being used in this manner in Psalms 139, verse 3. It is equivalent to investigate, search out to, a ver- to the very bottom, to scrutinize or pay close attention to. Now check out, this is the last part he wrote. Lastly, meaning that it is an action with continuous effect that is brought about by the actor. In other words, the actions of God knowing us is something that does not cease to occur, and impacts everything we do. That is taking that word. I know it's just the word search. No, it's not. That is taking that word all the way back to the true intent. Here's the best analogy I could think of it. Has anybody used a skill saw? Come on, woodworkers out there, right? Skill saw, circulating saw. So when I'm following my line or my path, inevitably what happens is the chaff or the wood shavings get in the way. That word is God doing this on that line continually. It actually goes back to the agricultural term as the chaff is getting thrown in the air. God's blowing the distractions, blowing the noise away and saying, this is it continuously. It isn't like he walks away, one blow, and then he's out. What he's doing is he's continuously resetting my asthma. That should jazz, that I nerded out on that because I'm like, oh my goodness, God is always, always, always directing my steps. He's always involved there. Okay, let's get into, let's keep going. Verse number four. Even before the word is on my tongue, before, O Lord, you know it altogether. Okay, get ready. Here we go again. You hem me in behind, before, and lay your hand upon me. Okay, KJV. Second word on verse 5. I have him. What do you have? What? Hest? Okay, so I have one that says beset. New King James Version has hedge. ESV has him. So you hem me in. Actually, going back to the original text here, in Hebrew, it says confine, assault, enclose, fortify, check this one out, besiege, and bind. It's, it's a term of aggression. Why would he say that? When I originally read this, I'm like, him, like on the side of your pants or on a shirt. I was actually thinking I could bring up something that I tried to him and destroyed. It, it has nothing to do with sewing. It has everything to do with the gospel. Let's, let's jump over to Matthew chapter 18. This is real quick. Matthew chapter 18, verse 12. It says, this is Jesus speaking. It's in red. He says, this is the parable of the lost sheep. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and the one of them go astray, does he not leave the 99 on the mountain and go and search for the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it. Go, go, why would God have to search for me? Well, I'll tell you, in my DNA... In my blood, it, the very nature of my body is sinful. I am that lamb. I am the, the joker, the knucklehead that's like, hey, it's awesome over here, but I'm going that way. 
in my DNA, it goes right back to the depravity of myself. I am leaving the 99 and I'm going at myself. And you know what the good shepherd does? He actually goes and besieges me. He grabs me. And if we were to follow the train of thought of what Christ is saying here and Jewish culture, what the Jewish good shepherd would do is grab that lamb, throw it on his shoulders and bring it back. And then when the knucklehead, me, continues to do it, you know what he does? Ultimately, he breaks the leg of the lamb, puts it on his shoulder, binds it, and he carries that lamb until he gets it through his skull. This is where you need to be. Guys, This one word in Psalms 139 is the epitome of the gospel. He goes after the lost. I'm not naturally going towards him. I'm going to steal this analogy. It's like a lion. If you put a salad in front of a lion, he ain't going to eat it. He's going to go to the stake. I'm going towards the stake. My natural tendency is evil. But when God grabs you and pulls you back, He changes your want to. That's the gospel right there. It's not me making that decision because I would just keep going that way. How powerful is God's word? One little word and it opens the door to the gospel. My kids, when when I teach the kids in the back... Uh, back at Napa campus, I asked him, is Jesus in the Old Testament? And they're like, uh, yeah, he is on every part of it. His fingerprint is there. The gospel is it, it, all the way back at Genesis. The gospel is there. And man, that should fire us up. Somebody say amen in here, please. Amen. Please. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Getting into verse six, it says, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. That should be like, oh my gosh, this is mind-blowing, right? But the problem is, getting back to my introduction, the problem is we've got bad theology of who God is. That's just like going into my old ID and changing junk. Our bad theology of who God is devalues his role in my life. And once that happens, everything falls apart. So let's get back to the biblical understanding of who God is, shall we? Verse number seven, it says, where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, okay, so Sheol is not hell, that's death. If I make my bed in death, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning, wings is not like flappy bird things. Wings is distance. It's like the east is from the west. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the utter parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night, even darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as day, for darkness is the light to you. If this doesn't take you and push you back just a little bit, I want to double down on this. I want to challenge you on something. Do you have a true biblical appreciation of the God of the universe? If this doesn't make you like, oh man, yeah, okay, whatever. I'm just kind of anesthetized to it. Let's jump over to Job chapter 38, shall we? And I want, I want to be very careful here because tone is one of those things. I was talking to somebody, I think yesterday I was talking to my son. I go, tone in the Bible can be missed. So I'm going to be very careful with the next section. Job 38, who better to understand who God is than God himself? Job 38, and what I want you to do is I want, to inter- I want you to interject your name in here. Just for this period of time. Don't be chief, no fun. Play with me. Look. Put your name in Job 38, just for a second. It says, this is God answering all the lunacy of Job's friends. God interjects. He says, out of a tornado, out of a whirlwind. Then the Lord answered Job, and out of the whirlwind. He said, who is this that darkens a counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man. And I feel like I can put the passion in there because, listen, God's saying, man up, because I'm going to hold you accountable. 
Dress for action like a man, and I will question you. You make it known to me. How often do we go to God and say, why did that happen? I'm guilty of it. Who am I to say that to the creator of the universe? Where were you, Vaughn, when when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me, Vaughn, if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely, Vaughn, you know. Boy, if you put your name in there, pretty soon you start figuring out, I'm not God. On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid the cornerstone, by the way? Another picture towards Christ. When when the morning stars sang for joy and all the sons of God shouted for joy, were we there? No. How dare I mess with the identity of God? Something needs to be sacred still to us. Can I get an amen to that? Somebody needs to tell me that that's still sacred. Yes, God is sacred. We need to have hands off. God's identity is very clear in his scripture. And what we like to do is tailor it so that I can tell, hey, let me, let me introduce you to my Jesus. This, this right here is our baseline. This is true. And then when we have bad theology, the next part falls apart. You know what the next part is? My identity. Maybe you're here today and you're like, man, I got the group discount. (laughs) I call it group discount. Because I went through a phase of my life when I thought, you know what, Jesus died on the cross for everybody. And I I just got thrown in there for the group discount. Has anybody else struggled with that? Well, you're like, God... Yeah, you like, you like all of us. But did you really have me in mind when you did that? Guys, I struggled with that. And you know why? Because my theology of God was horrible. And my theology of who God said I am is equally terrible. So if you get into verse 13, this is like one of my favorite chapters to pray over my kids. For you formed me in my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was being made in in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. So the problem with bad theology is when I don't appreciate who God is and God says that we should honor the sanctity of life, we blink at this part. And what we want to do is we want to call it a fetus, we want to call it cells, we want to call it stem cells, and and we want to call it what it isn't. And what it is is a divine gift that has been knit together, not from a fetus, but from the substance. And when we have bad theology, we blink at this, and countless millions of babies are being killed for what? I told you I like lightning rod issues. This should frustrate us. This should make us mad as Christians. And not, I'm not saying go and burn down buildings and, and kill people. I'm not saying that. You did not hear that from me. But what we need to do is it needs to start at the pulpits, and then you guys need to be the pulpits to everybody around us. You need to say, God is good. God recognizes you as a person from the day of your conception, and he loves you. That should fire us up. And you guys, I'm not yelling at you. I'm yelling because I'm fired up. I'm sick and tired of my kids going into a world like this. And I'm going to stand in this front, front of this freight train and say, people, have you, you have value in God. But do you ever wonder why people just discount that? It's discounted because they have no appreciation for their creator. See how this is linking together very, very closely. So if I have good identity in God, I have a biblical understanding of who God is. I have a biblical understanding now of who I am. 
The next is, is so powerful because now I have purpose. Now I have purpose. I, I pulled this from Wearsby, and Wearsby's a, a, he does a lot of great things. Uh, there's some things that I'm like, ah, eh, but this one was a good one. Wearsby's a Bible commentary. He says, what we think about God and our relationship to him determines what we think about everything else that makes up our busy world, other people, the universe, God's will, God's, God's word, sin, faith, and obedience. Wrong ideas about God will ultimately lead to wrong ideas about who we are, what we should do, and this leads to wrong life on the wrong path toward wrong destiny. As a pastor, as a next-gen pastor, I very, very rarely, and I used to say, I used to say that this was something I never wanted to do until I got an opportunity to do it. Um, I've been at the side of people that are, that are literally getting ready to do this, step off into eternity. And I remember an old guy one time, he, he, he goes, man, I, I just hope that I, I did enough good. And that's how that man stepped off into eternity. And, and my heart just breaks because how many of your friends right now would say, I don't really know what my purpose in life is. I'm just going about it. Or maybe the, maybe the youngest person in here, they're like, I, look, I've been told that I evolved from a, a fish. My son was, is actually going to be taught that this year. You're a fish. Great. So I've been told that from an early age, and there's no purpose in life, so I'm just going to live however I want to live it. But when we know who God is and when we know who we are in God, guess what? We have an azimuth, we have direction, and we know exactly what his intent for us to do, and that's to rest in him, to follow his path that he is setting for us. And then we can actually pray, verses 17 and 18, How precious to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! If I would count them, they are more than the sand, and I awake and I'm still with you. Listen, before Jesus, you can't pray that. You can say it all you want. You can say whatever comes out of your mouth, but you can't say how precious to me, God, are your ways. It's incongruent because if you disconnect and you discount his position as lordship, then there's no way that you can say that. But look at what David did. David is a believer in the Most High. He's a, he is a saved, regenerate man. And because he is, God changes your want to. i I got to be honest with you. Pre-Jesus, I was like, yeah, I'm going to go do all the fun stuff. Post-Jesus, I'm still doing fun stuff. But guess what? It's fun Jesus stuff. It's fun because I'm, I know where I'm at. How much peace is that, right? We're, we, we, get a, we get a rest in that. And I, 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 that should jazz us. As Christians, we should be on fire for that. Which leads us to the last part of that. We're going to skip down to Psalms 139, verses 23 and 24. This is, this is, these are dangerous verses. I, I, I'm just curious. Has anybody read these and actually prayed them seriously? Yeah, these are dangerous. Because you know what? He does it. <laughs> he answers this one all the time. And he'll, he'll be like, have you thought about that one? <laughs> As a child of God, you should be able to say, search me, O God. Know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there's any grievous way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. As a child of God, I want to be able to pray that every day. But because I cheapen all the other stuff at times, that, that makes that prayer really hard. So for those of you that are type A analytics, 
I usually throw you under a bus. I'm, I'm learning. I, God's teaching me how to be nice because I'm not type A. For those of you that are type A, and there are there is a sermon guide for you. And um, I gave it to you, but I wanted to use it specifically as a conclusion. And here's why. By now, you should have guessed what the main point is. And the main point is knowing the biblical Jesus means knowing me in Jesus. And I know that's a little bit wordy, but it goes back to the truth. If I try to figure out life on my own, there's no way that I'm going to have purpose. There's no more... I can have purpose just for the short time I'm here. But the true purpose is to live in Him so that when we run our race, we can look towards heaven and say, I ran the good race. I left it all on the court. Any players out there? I know there's a coach. Leave it all on the field. God, I left it all here. I did it all for you. Yeah, you're going to absolutely fumble it. But you know what? As a child of God, a righteous man gets back up, right? A righteous woman gets back up. So as a review, though, if I have bad theology, that means I don't know who he is. I don't know who I am, and I don't know the point of any of this. So I just gave you the answer, so you're writing those down. And then, Lester, if you'd come. Good theology means I understand the biblical Jesus. Do you really? Do, I mean, we can throw his name, or we have thrown, we. We throw Jesus' name around for a political agenda all the time. How about instead of taking somebody else's word on who Jesus is, go find out. It's all right here in red. He, he said a lot. And he was very, very clear on who he was and who he wasn't. So if I have good biblical grasp on who Jesus is, and I sit at people with good teaching, really good biblical sound gospel-centered teaching, then that means I understand me and Him. And that should bring us the greatest peace right there. You should just be like, oh, man, that's nice. And then finally, if, if all those two come together, then I know I got a job. And you guys, you guys have a job. Well, I have a job. I got three boys. I'm raising them the very best I can according to what is written in here, not what is written in culture. I'm doing the very, very best that I can. And then I'm doing the very, 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 very best that I can to love the people around me, even the ones that yell at, at me all the time for doing something stupid because I do a lot of stupid stuff. But I want to love well. So my question to you is, listen, if you'd bow your hand, heads and just, just focus in, let's just throw away all the noise just for a second. I want to ask you, do you have peace about this? Do you truly have peace that you're in Jesus? If not, keep your head down. Let's pray about it right now. Let's pray. God, there's people in this room, I, I, I know it, that they don't have peace with that. God, help them to dive into your word and find your identity, then their identity, then them in you. God, this isn't one of those things that they need to get in their car, drive home and forget about. Lord, this has to happen. I don't want them to walk through life unknowing, not knowing where they're going to end up. Be with that person. And then maybe, maybe you just needed a shot in the arm today to be like, yeah, God, search me. Search me and know my ways. Reveal in me where I'm deficient. This prayer is for you. God, I pray for that person. They needed a shot in the arm today. They needed to say, God, search me now. Reveal where I'm dropping it. And then help me to get back on that path that you have laid out in front of me. Guys, I'm, I'll be back in the next steps when we close out. Come find me. Let's talk. If you want to stay in a 
in a position of worship, I'm going to let Lester, you just play it out for a little bit. And let's just give it about a couple minutes. You guys do your business with God, and I'll be back in the next steps, and I'll let Lester close up shop.